People's Republic of Moya, the PRM. The land is hard, cold. The fields are barren for nine months of the year and knee-deep in snow for three. During summer we sweat and our skin sticks in the humid air. In winter the ice hangs from the rooftops, 15 inches long. And yet, here we all are. At times in the long winter nights, the geography of Moya adds to the oppressive nature of the place. Mountains in the east and west, an ocean as vast as it is angry and unwelcoming to the south. And right there, on the northern doorstep, the greatest empire the world has known. Naturally, unacknowledged in any official sense. An absurd incongruity that every person in Moya has come to terms with at some point in their lives. The lengths that are taken to bring us all together can be extreme at times, and yet, it's the things we mustn't speak about that nail the job home. Here we all are. The fields rush past, flanking the roadside as far as I can see. I-39 is a farming community. Entire families sit upon rusted machinery, rotten in place, unmoving for generations. Once I hit the border checkpoint, I need to head west for three more hours along the main and only bypass that connects a nothing sector to the industry of I-45, a concrete lifeline. At least the snow has eased in recent days. The wind remains a biting companion to a steel sky. The heated seating of the ministry car mercifully works without a hitch and despite the landscape painting a sadistic picture outside, This small metal box, travelling at a constant 70 miles an hour, cuts through it with a satisfying comfort. The checkpoint approaches as a small black dot on the flat horizon, and I lean forward to switch the radio on. Grainy horns sprint through the calm interior of the car, reverberating from the glass on the windows, scratching around in triumph. I've nothing to fear from the checkpoint. My ministry pass generally sees me wash through with ease, And these country folk, they have little reason or will to stop anyone, let alone an official from I-01. But it doesn't stop my palms from sweating every single time. 400 metres and I can see the guardrail drop across the road, cutting through the sky as it grinds into action, the red rust flaking off and floating to rest on the snow that builds up around the base. 200 metres and out steps the guard. He lifts up an arm, fist high in the air, feet tightly together. He'll hold the position until my car comes to a stop beside him, which means he recognises the status that a car like this lends me, even from this distance. I doubt the same level of vigilance will be enacted for everyone who passes through today, if anyone other than me passes through at all. 50 metres and I can already see the disappointment in his face when he sees my ID. Not quite the exciting tale over dinner this evening that he might have hoped. My car slows, ice under the wheels cracking on the concrete and comes to a stop perfectly beside the guard. The horns ring out, breaking the silence left from the sudden quiet that replaces the drone of the steady engine. ID please, he blurts out before the cracking in the window is barely an inch wide. I toy with the idea of asking him to repeat himself once my window stops fully open with a short thunk. The guard is thin, which is little surprise. His uniform hangs from his shoulders slightly, the stiff padding a poor substitute for a good diet. He looks young, which probably explains his enthusiasm. That and the car. I took out my ID from inside my coat pocket and passed it over to him, looking up at the sky whilst I held it out through the window. Looks like more snow tonight. I said as casually as I could while simultaneously wringing my palms, my fingers slipping across the greasy surface. That's what I hear, sir. Meant to be coming in from the south, clearing in the morning. You won't be driving through the night, I hope. I certainly hope not. I'm stopping over here in 42 for the evening, just down by 45, so I should get there before it comes down. That's good, sir. Don't recommend driving through the night if you can help it. He passed the ID back to me and I took note of the slight air of suspicion in his eyes. It's all for show. You can pass through the same checkpoint every day for a year and the guard stationed there will offer the same look as he cast his gaze over the same ID he has seen every day prior. I'm sure it's part of the curriculum when assigned the job. You hear about the bodies? He asked, 
as he released the leather wallet into my hand. I'm afraid I, I can't really discuss business, I lie. Understood, sir. From each us all. From each us all. My window revs back up and I gave the guard a small nod. As I sit back in the chair, the engine starts back up and the dull drone rolls back under the sound of the radio. The gate rises, all scrapes and metallic groans. A small nap would not be so bad about now. As the car lurches forwards, slowly accelerating out onto the bypass of I-42, my muscles relax and I cross my arms across my chest, nestling into the heated seat. A rusted tractor looms large, casting a shadow into the small farmhouse. The snow is all but melted away and the spring air is fresh. I can smell some sweet herbal soup coming from somewhere inside on occasional waves of warm air. The house is an old wooden structure, flakes of paint hang in the sunlight, the occasional loose fleck drifts off on the breeze that sways the front door gently, occasionally tapping as it backs off into its frame before falling open again. Entering the house, I recognise it as that of a childhood friend that I knew at middle school. We often spent afternoons there as his father was an important ministry man and his mother worked in the sector reassignment bureau, so we could do as we pleased until they returned home for dinner. A barely audible jazz tune plays in the background and in the bathroom next to the hallway sits Sophie. Her shirt is wet and drips onto the floor. I call out to her but she either can't hear me or she chooses not to. Her hair is a little darker than I remember it but her skin is the same, olive and tanned. A thread of brown hair gently rests on the nape of her neck. Sitting in the chair by the open fire, I can smell the burning wood and ash thick in the air. The radio is playing at half speed and my mother is washing plates in the kitchen. There's a burning sensation in the back of my head and I turn around in my chair. She stares back at me with large green eyes. A tear slips across her cheek. The light of the flickering fireplace reflects and shimmers on the surface of the salt water. Breath exhales from the depths of my stomach. My arms are stiff in their sockets. A familiar voice slices through the room. Each of us all. Each of us all, Howard. And I must say, thank you for such a wonderful programme you crafted for us tonight. This is the news at seven. I'm tr- I sit up and switch the radio off. The light outside is almost entirely extinguished the sun already having slipped away behind the clouds and below the horizon. I look over at the GPS on the dash. Nice timing, just a few more miles to go. I pulled up in the quiet street at around 7.30. The orange streetlights, spaced apart so as to always seem one too few, lit the snow on the ground as my feet crunched and snapped with every step. The night air was grippingly cold after the warmth of the car, and I stuffed my hands into my pockets as I hopped up onto the curb and pulled open the small wooden gate to the house. There was only a low orange glow from one room casting a dim light out onto the small garden. I presume that I'm expected, but perhaps not this late. A dog barks somewhere in the distance, but otherwise the street is utterly silent, aside from the low, barely perceivable din of a TV set coming from one of the small concrete boxes. I rapped on the door as I stepped up onto the porch, which has a soft but noticeable give underfoot. My knuckles sting on the hard surface. There was a shuffling, a few low knocks, and then the sound of scraping metal as the latch was slipped back into its barrel and the door swung open. Inside was an old-looking man, probably in his 70s or 80s. That alone is fairly unusual sight out here, and his wispy white hair combed across his head loosely, hurriedly without the aid of a comb, only lent to encourage his unique appearance. Each of us all, sir, he welcomed me. I didn't expect you any more today, what with the weather and all. Each of us all. I did debate whether to stop in tonight or if best not to leave it until tomorrow morning, but I didn't want to leave you hanging just in case. I gave the man a small smile in the hope that he might relax. It will really be no good if he clams up from the outset, as all too often happens once you get outside of the big five. May I? I gestured towards the interior. 
Oh, of course, of course. Come, come. Can I get you a tea? Something warm to drink? Tea would be lovely, thank you. The old man's house was small but intimate. I doubt he has been reassigned for over 50 years with everything he seemed to have accumulated. Dusty pictured. On every surface was something to look at. A dusty picture frame here and there, old copies of the star yellowing with age, and VHS tapes precariously stacked up to several feet high. Everything in the room was either beige, brown or orange, and there were several furnishings so old that they looked to be imports. In the far wall of the room, a small open fire crackled as smoke from the dark wood slipped away up through the chimney. I picked up a thick woolen cushion just as he returned carrying a small tray with two china cups, steaming and carrying a herbal spice scent. Oh, you'll not be interested in those, sir, he said. A little off-handedly, I thought, considering the law on imported goods. His was a different generation and one that holds far less fear or authority than the younger population. This would, I hoped, work in my favour. Here you are, sir. You should be needing this, I'd have thought, he said, as he passed me the cup of tea and nodded at the window overlooking the street outside. The snow had just started falling again. Oh, it's, it's not so bad, really. The ministry cars can be quite comfortable. What is this, if I may ask? I nodded towards the tea as I held it up to my nose, taking in the woody steam. That's what we call grass tea, sir. Used to make it often when I was younger and, uh... Well, when I was younger. Had a little patch of herbs and grasses, used to grab it and sell it and trade it. Did me alright, it did. Again, the old man mentioned this as if it were nothing to confess such irregularities to an officer of the ministry. As far as I remember, private markets have certainly not been permissible in my, nor his, lifetime. You don't need to use sir, by the way. Call me James, I said, holding out my hand. The old man leant forward and shook it gently. Each of us all, James. I suppose you'll be wanting the ins and outs of it then, will you? Just the general idea, if you will. As I said... I just wanted to stop in tonight, really, and I'll need to check in somewhere before that gets too heavy, I said, nodding out of the front window. Oh, of course, James, of course. There's a small place just one road over that's decent, run by my grandson as it happens. He'll take you, no doubt. Have you come from the Big Five today, then, have you? Oh, one, left this morning. As I mentioned O1, he raised his eyebrows in mock surprise and let out a breathy whistle. I'm surprised you take such an interest, to be honest. When I called it in, I didn't expect much. The local ministry bods, I usually deal with anything round here, you know. They don't like involving higher-ups, no doubt. Yes, well, each of us all. Exactly, James, exactly. So, when was it? He leaned back into the familiar indentations of the soft beige chair. I was out there yesterday morning about 8, 8.15. I'm often out early in the morning, grabbing up herbs and grasses. Early hours is the best time, you see. If they're frozen, you can snap them off nice and easily down at the root. The path itself, it cuts up through the wooded area out back. It's not often used anymore. It used to lead up to an old mill, but you know as I do, that's not been operational for, God, 15, 20 years or so at least. There's not much else to say, James. I went onto the path for about a minute or so, and there they were. The two of them just laying in the middle, out in the open. Was there anything... Did you notice anything that stood out, aside from the obvious shock of the bodies, of course? I asked, shifting forward a little in my seat. There was a long way for this one to go yet, but I had to admit that I was already intrigued. Well, the young lad, I'd say he was in his early twenties, about my grandson's age. Same build, same sort of frame. He was wearing a local ministry uniform. Ripped and torn it was though, they were quite big pieces. He gestured a space between the ring fingers of each hand of about eight inches as he spoke. About that, I'd say. Material just thrown across the path. The girl he was with, 
She was the much worse off of the two. She was wearing a plain dress. Again, it had great big tears and the material was lighter in colour, see? So you could see the blood. It's not pretty. He shook his head and leant all the way back into his chair. I didn't take much more of a look past that. If something was about, I wasn't planning on waiting around to see. So I turned back and I came straight home. Like I said, there's not much to it, honestly, James. I gave the old man a moment to settle himself and drink at his tea and then asked, You said, if something was about, what something did you expect? <laughs> Nothing gets by you, does it, James? I expect that's why you're up there in 01. Nah, I didn't mean anything by it. I didn't think much, in all honesty. I thought at first it could be a large cat or some other large animal, but then... Well... That wouldn't make much sense now, would it, James? It certainly wouldn't. I placed the empty teacup onto a small dark wood stool and made to stand up. Well, I think it's time that I get off. If I may, I'll pop back tomorrow morning, spend a little more time. Perhaps me and you could take a walk up this path and you can show me where you found them. Certainly, James, but don't come too early or she won't find me likely. I'll be out foraging as usual. Past nine, I should be home. He made to stand up, but I gestured quickly. No, no, I'll, I'll see myself out, don't worry. Past nine it is then. Each of us all. Each of us all, James. I stepped back out into the cold night chill. The old man seemed sincere enough, but for now, I can't be worrying too much about what may or may not be. I made to the car and jumped inside. As it pulled away into the snow-covered road, I took a glance back at the old man's house, his silhouette standing by the window. I gave it a small nod. Each of us all. Moya was created by Ben Cutmore. Intro and outro music is used under Creative Commons Attribution License and is called Russian Winter by Tim from tabletopaudio.com. You can help support the show by heading over to patreon.com forward slash Moya podcast. And as thanks, you gain access to a private Discord server, as well as early access to episodes and all that other good stuff. Thanks for listening.